Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. This week, we are headed to Sweden. Yeah, we're here joined by Fragzy, a.k.a. Kurt. He's been running his local scene out in uh, Malmo for the last year or so, and we saw that he had a big team tournament come up recently and wanted to, you know, touch base and find out a little about Sweden. We've been hopping all around the world, so, you know, hopping back over to Sweden and catching up with a player who's been playing Hand of the Archon, among other teams. And hopefully, we, yeah, hopefully by the end of the podcast today, we'll get into building a team plan or a game plan for teams like Hand of the Archon or Commandos. But yeah. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. And uh, I'm so glad you came to Sweden to say hello and check out the Kill Team scene here. Yeah, it seems like things have been growing. Uh, I did a little bit of digging on, you know, Best Coast Pairings, trying to figure out how big your tournaments have been. And I've seen it's like all the way from six. And this most recent tournament, your team tournament, seemed like it uh, capped up at 18, which is probably, what, three times larger than the, your normal tournament size? Yeah, you could say. We have had a couple of tournaments with uh, 12 and 16 players uh, in my hometown, Malmö. And uh, there's been like uh, up in Stockholm, which is the capital city. They, I think they had like 24 people tournaments once or twice. Um, but the player base is pretty small in every region here, I would say. Yeah. But we are up I mean, and comers. Getting, getting everyone together is always a hard thing. Um, before we get into things, you know, this week we do have another new patron for our Patreon. Shout outs to uh, Will, Will L. He's been playing Legionary for the last year. I got him into Kill Team by uh, giving him a box of Chaos Space Marines and saying first hits free. Classic. Yeah. yeah it's a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous hobby drug. You know, once you start playing, you yeah. can't stop. <clears throat> Plastic crack. Yeah. yeah, that's definitely true. What have you guys been up to uh, locally outside of Kill Team? Well, I've been uh, outside of Kill Team. Yeah, well... <laughs> I've been working and uh, hanging around with my family. Went to the woods. Yeah, nice. have a good time. Yeah, you know, I just went to the uh, Halloween parade in New York, and it's a uh, it's always a bit fun time. I think it's like the fiftieth year in a row, so it's like a humongous thing that takes up multiple city blocks, and it's just people packed out to watch people walk walk. I think I saw Thriller. There's like a fifty people doing a Thriller dance scene on the road. That's pretty cool. That's pretty what wild. about you, Jason? It's uh, everything's covered in snow here. We got our first snow of the year and it didn't instantly melt. So it's all snowy and cold and it's the beginning, is the of, beginning of the hibernation season for Jason. It basically is. Yeah. So everything like work is all finally calming down. Um, I got in a bunch of kill team games. Um, I got in a bunch of test games for the game that I've been building, which is called The End. Um, which, you know, there's little hints and secrets and tips about that coming along. Um, I've got a website put together for the core rules so that the, the core rules can be digital and just kind of like taking a giant swing away from work and, and, and moving into games. Lots and lots of games. Yeah, I think, you know, you're going to post something on Patreon about that so people can get an early look at the rules. Yes. Yeah, definitely swing by. Um, and while you're at it, if you haven't, if you're listening and you haven't already left a review, you should do that. We appreciate the reviews. It helps us get found. And you should also join the Discord. We've got a yeah, Discord yeah. and that'll be linked in the podcast description as well. Yeah, a Discord with Patreon or with uh, guests from all around the world now. We've got, you know, Australia, Canada, Europe, Russia. It's great. I to check that out for sure. Yeah. And if you have any rules questions, it's a good spot to ask because there are tons of TOs on there. And I think generally we're all on the same page. So if you're curious about what TOs are thinking about any specific rule, Discord is a great spot to just uh, ask real quick. Yeah, that's absolutely yeah. true. Topic of the day, you know, talking a little bit about the small Swedish kill team scene, you know, smaller than some of the other U.S. scenes just because U.S. is so large, but it seems like it's been growing. So that's a, definitely has. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, when it comes to g when you started getting your events going, um, what did that look like? Is it like 
Do you have like a consistent schedule, just like a group of friends that was already there? Are you making a bunch of new friends along the way? Like, how's the the growth of the scene? So uh, for myself, I haven't been playing Warhammer before. Uh, I catch the Octarius box when on more or less on the release, I think. I saw like an ad on the internet and I felt like, wow, this is a great game for me and my son. We can start playing. And we we shared the box. He got the commandos. I got the vet guard, and uh, he dropped off two weeks later. So I was stuck there on my own with two teams. And um, uh, and then I remember one of my closest friends had uh, some Eldari models. So yes. we started playing together. And yeah, from there I found this local game store that had a good venue, but not really any players. So I started from there, asking around if people want to play kill team with me i assume you guys had like a local discord that maybe you start off with um well not or... not that's at first no not the local one but we have the swedish uh, discord uh, kill team channel that's pretty big now i would say do you have your own local channel now or is it all on um your you have like the larger swedish kill team discord or do you guys use facebook because i know different regions use different uh social media tools to connect together I think some places are still using Facebook pretty heavily, so I'm just curious. Yeah, well, uh, on on the national basis, to communicate between uh, different cities, we use Discord. And we have this Discord channel called uh, Kill Team Sweden, I think it's called. It's run by some co- people from Stockholm. Uh, but locally, I throw up all my events on uh, Facebook as well as Discord. Uh, try to find players, talk to people down the at the local game store. and. Yeah, there are some couple of other stores as well where I go to and hang out and talk to people to promote my events. Yeah, it sounds like you, you're working hard to find people. So like when it comes to the kinds of people that you're finding, are you finding that like, are they the kind of people that have already been playing Warhammer 40k or like not at all? And they're, this is their introduction into the universe or like um, something else entirely? What's that kind of like, what's that look like for the people you're finding? Yeah, so they're like, Two different, two kinds of people, I would say. It's uh, the ones that's like me, me and my friends, hasn't really played Warhammer before, but uh, we like, we are gamers, I would say, like played Counter Strike a lot or League of Legends before, like, uh, yeah, competing. And we like the competitive thing about Kill Team. Uh, Then they are the other ones that come from Big Hammer, which is a big thing in Sweden, I would say. Just a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, Malmö Wargaming Weekend with. uh, a 40k event with 110 players, I think. So it's quite big for our region. So it's a mix between those two types of the players. And the big hammer players are mostly casual players. And then we are like a core uh, core group with the competitive players, like five or 10, I would say. Yeah, I've definitely found that 40k kind of airs on the side of a little bit more casual at the tournament. Like you might <clears throat> people might be bringing a couple hundred models out to the tournament, but a lot of people are like, I think this is really cool. So I'm just going to play it at a tournament. But in Kill Team, it's a much more competitive experience just because the lists are a little bit more like tightly balanced around what is or is not playable. So I've seen that that can be a turnoff sometimes because some people are just like, ah, oh, it's too competitive. So how how has the Swedish scene been working around the, you know, competitiveness of the game? Well, uh, it's growing and I, I can my forecast is it will grow a lot next season, season three next year. And um, so I, I threw my first uh, tournament December last year. Uh, it had uh, I think it was 12, pay, 12 players who played strictly ITD. And since then, I think I'm, I've done some research myself here. Uh, in Sweden, we have had like, I think it's 22 tournaments since then. Uh, all between six players and 24 players. And there's like four regions for this. It's Malmö, the town where I come from. It's the capital city, Stockholm, Gothenburg, and up north in Umeå, which is a student city. Have you seen and, any like uh, meta differences between your four regions? Yeah, I would say so for this last month, uh, it has been a lot of elite teams, uh, both here down in the south and up in the west. Um, but I, I don't think it's like a local meta thing. I think it's like um, just a tournament meta, because mm-hmm. for me, for example, I've been playing a different team every tournament I go to. 
Uh, and I think there are a lot of other people doing that thing as well. And right now, I think I will stop doing that and just, you know, practice one team, getting better. Yeah, you know. Yeah, com comfortability with the team definitely does help as if you want to keep going to larger tournaments, I think. Just having less room for you to make small mistakes or just being unfamiliar with your own rules can definitely be a, a big thing if you're competing regularly. Sure. Do you feel like there's anything that makes your specific scene special compared to some of the other ones? Um, I don't know. Uh, since we are such a small scene, it's uh, I, th I think every scene has been where we are right now. You know, finding players, introducing. Uh, I've been very inspired by uh, Taylor and the Cats and the Pacific Northwest. You know how they run stuff and they. They had this kill scream uh, tournament last year. I don't, I don't know, maybe twenty players or so. You know this more than me. And then yeah. they threw this kill scream too. It's, it's. It, I think it like tripled in size. Yeah, I think you yeah. know for for my part on the New York Open, we went from I think like thirty players to forty players, and then we doubled up in size on everything else, and we added in BattleTech and Necromunda. So yeah, it's been it's been fun. I think if you put the work in and you just Make sure you're consistent so people know where to show up. I think that definitely helps. And then always being very welcoming to new players. I think that's the, the thing in competitive games that can get lost very easily. Is some people will just want to be as competitive as possible all the time. But new players definitely need a, a little bit of a softer onboarding than a just hardcore competitive games, I think. For sure. For sure. So that's what uh, we have done with uh, my local at my lo uh, my local region so to say we have uh, most recently we had this kill team october thing mm -hmm. four events with a couple of tournaments and uh, then kill team tuesdays where we hang out talk and play games of kill team and uh, trying to get more people into uh, the hobby and playing competitively do you have um like the onboarding for building models and painting or is just you know, like eat more casual games. Tell us a little bit about your Kill Team October events. So, so the Kill Team Tuesdays have been mostly casual gaming and uh, introducing uh, new people. So, like demo games. I've had a couple of demo games with, uh, yeah, totally new players. And some of them have uh, been coming to our tournaments afterwards. Uh, but the, the local game store where I am, uh, where, which I'm connected with is called uh, Rapid Tabletop Gaming here in Malmo. Great store. Uh, they have uh, hobby nights as well. So we do Tuesdays with Kill Team and on Thursdays they have hobby nights. So totally new players can go there, catch a Kill Team in the store and start building them straight away. Yeah, that's definitely a nice part of the game. I think sitting down and like walking someone through the entire hobby process is definitely a, a net positive, especially for it is a really big uh, jump in from going from like card games or video games where something is kind of most things are taken care of for you. You're like, ah, you're actually going to have to build your game piece. Yeah, and you need Rightly. like sharp tools that are like, you know, way more dangerous than a video game. And you got to clip things and glue things. And yeah. Yeah, I've definitely heard a lot of people say that painting is a really big, um, it's very intimidating, but once you kind of get into, oh, you know what, it's better for something to have paint than not have paint. So just getting things primed and just having people start putting on uh, colors definitely helps. Because I feel like there's a big new player thing where people are like, oh, I don't want to ruin my model. And it's like, look, it's only ruined if you never do anything. If it stays gray, it's never going to look cool. But you got to you got to start somewhere, right? Just like starting the tournament scene somewhere. For sure, for sure. The painting and the hobby thing has been growing in me, definitely. Uh, yeah. I would say I'm a player at heart and competitive, competitive player at heart, but the hobby always growing on me, for sure. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason why the painting channels and like the lore channels are far more popular than competitive channels and the like yeah. in the YouTube and like all the 40K space for as much as competitive players think that in the center of the world, most players are not. A lot of players just want to just hang out with their friends and have fun. So I think Kill Team, making it approachable is really, really important, and especially for newer scenes. I know when I was growing our local Kill Team scene, it was like I was there, you know, every week teaching people how to play. Now I have a couple other players locally that help me out with that, which is great at the shop. And I do one of the other stores once a week just to help people get into it. Because, yeah, it's a complicated game. Cool. 
How's the well, how, uh, uh, to finish off the Kill Team Actor, I'm just gonna take yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um we finished it off with this uh, three player team tournament that you have been um, touching the subject of. And this was the big one for us. Um, I really, I've been feeling like since the spring, I really wanted to throw a team tournament, connecting different cities, uh, inviting players, and you know, um, have a have this team spirit thing on a tournament. I think it's real, real nice experience. What was the so uh, that was the big thing. Your, What was the format for your team tournament? Were you doing a sword and shield, where you know team captains are picking up matchups and stuff? How many boards? It's three players, so I assume like two open, one in the dark, or vice versa, depending on the table. Yeah, so we didn't do the uh, Sword and Shields thing. Uh, I was uh, writing to K. Kudrin, the Russian TO, uh, before mm -hmm. this uh, tournament. But I decided to um, do a three-play tournament with a captain where they, uh, we had a roll-off and uh, between the captains mm -hmm. and the team that won choose the first matchup so uh, like my void answers want to beat your intercessors and then the intercessors um uh the losing team could choose the map and okay. then you um yeah go back and forth so uh, as you said we had one itd and two open boards uh for every matchup and uh, it went great did you yeah, do the really thing? I think when we had Kirill on a couple weeks ago, he mentioned that one of the open boards would be more dense, one of them would be a little bit sparser, and one of them would be in the dark. So how, is that what you were going for? Yeah, a similar way. Uh, we used, uh, uh, for, for every set of uh, kill zones, we had ITD, as I said before, and then we had an Octarius terrain with uh, the Turning Point Tactics version 2 maps. And for the third kill zone, we used a mix of Shalnath terrain and um, uh, containers, uh, but not as dense as the um, Octarius terrain. Okay, yeah, I think and that's those a... and those kill zones had never been seen before. They were made that day, and everybody agreed to, yeah, we are going to use these three. So it was like a surprise element in the tournament. Yeah, I always like a little bit of a surprise element. Yeah, I'm a yeah, huge fan sure. of that too. How was the uh, how did the turning point tactics two version two maps go through? Because I haven't seen them yet. I played on the version one ones at Nova, and I think a lot of people didn't love them because Commandos basically just ate, took everyone's lunch <laughs> at Nova. <laughs> oh, but I well, haven't seen I, the, think... I haven't seen the V two, so I don't know if they've fixed those problems. So I... how did your players enjoy them? Uh, we enjoyed them, and I I think they might have been the ones you have played on. Uh, it is the one that are used on. Uh... TTS as well right now. So for like um, command point tactics, they had this fall um, fall tournament on TTS. We used the same ones there, uh, and I've been using these ones when I went to Stockholm in the beginning of the summer. We used them, so they have been around for like half a year, I think. Okay, yeah, it's probably the same map pack that I played on then. Which yeah, yeah there's probably. three midboard heavies that are kind of basically on. Um... They're just completely like straight placed so that if you're in one, you can see into the other one. Exactly. Well, yeah. yeah. Which is which is a great commando hunting ground. Did you have commandos <laughs> taken taken over the uh, kill team 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 tournament? Uh, no, not really. So we had two people playing commandos and uh, I don't think they were so experienced with it. Not with the team and not with the game, actually. But okay. um, so the more experienced players played uh, legionaries. Uh, we had two great players, one from Stockholm and from Gothenburg, playing um, Void Scars. They did real well. We had uh, another guy from Stockholm who took home the MVP awards. He was playing Novitiates. Great, great guy. Oh, yeah. And uh, myself, I played Legionaries. <clears throat> nice, yeah. right? What was the uh, winning team layout? How, like, in terms of, was it all three experienced players or was it a couple experienced players helping a newer player, like, learn the game? I'm kind of curious if you guys had any they breakout performances yeah well the winning team so f for, for for the first thing um number one and number two the teams they had exactly the same tournament points but they were uh the tiebreaker was tack ups and they put, i think it was like a five point difference between the teams okay um and the winning team they were playing commandos uh void scars and what was this third I don't remember right now, but uh, there were three friends from Gothenburg. 
and one of them is the the head CEO of uh, that region. He's called his name is Michael. Great guy. Right. So a lot of the strong meta teams, right? And especially in team tournaments, having players or having teams with skew matchups is great because you can have people cover for each other in some on some level. Exactly. Right? Like Void Dancers are not great against Pathfinders and some of the wider teams. And, you know, so having them not get those matchups consistently is good. Or like Custodies getting in the dark a little bit more often would make them much better. Sure, for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you have any like hometown heroes, like players that you've been working with a lot locally that really help you get the scene working on your end? Or do you feel like you've been doing a lot of the it's like you're doing Malmo really hard and then each of the other TOs is doing their own region and you guys just meet at tournaments? Yeah, I think it's the later. But but to be to be fair, there's a lot of people always helping out on the tournament day. Uh, there's no exception to that. There's People are always willing to come in early, help out with the terrain building. Uh, I have this friend of mine, Simon. He always comes to the casual Kill Team Tuesdays, hanging out, bringing bringing stuff. You know, a uh, great guy. Big shout out to him. And uh, a lot of friends, you know, just like yeah, you're doing a great job. Just pepping, pepping and prepping. I would say, but I'm I'm doing most most of the stuff myself actually. Yeah. And I think it's the same for every other region in my country, uh, Stockholm and Gothenburg. Yeah. Yeah. Having, um, you know, as the TO, you are like the focal point, but then having all the people that help the TO make things work is uh, a big part, at least in, you know, locally for Brooklyn. I do a lot of the work, but we also have other people that are helping us with the New York Open. We've got a guy from Jersey who always helps us you know prep supplies and he has a lot of the open terrain which is great and i think we're yeah he helped me do goonhammer open so we've got a lot of people it's always the tos but there's there's more to it there's more to it and of course my my local game store is uh once again a big shout out to them they have a great venue where we always welcome to play there uh, yeah so the new york open it's it's right around the corner isn't it it is by the time this comes out it will be in the rear view mirror so we're releasing ah, this on monday it'll be it'll have to, it'll have already happened so i'm I'm sure it'll be a great event i have no idea who's gonna win and unfortunately i'm not gonna take a guess because we have a lot of good players coming so i don't want to i don't want to spoil it yeah we'll have we'll have had around 40 people show up for the gt and then 20 people for narrative both days and then eight people for necro and eight people for BattleTech. And then we have like a painting competition and a social event. So a big jump up in terms of what we're doing for the event compared to last year, where it was just like a a small narrative thing and then a 30 person GT. Um, So, yeah, this year we're doing like the whole mixed board terrain and we'll we'll see how it goes. I'm excited to have it. It's like in the heart of New York this year. So and and it's much more stressful. I believe we got custom mats. We got custom custom objective markers. We've got. You know, T-shirts. We've got the whole shebang. So we'll, I'm sure, I'm sure some people will show up with it. And we've, I think we still have some of the playmats uh, to be sold. So I think if we have any left over, if you're on our Patreon, I will be able to get at least you'll have access to it. Yeah, they're super and cool. Should get those shirts. Definitely worth a look. Yeah, but I think we gotta hop down to some more competitive-minded stuff, right, Jason? Yes, it is time to move right along into the Operative Showdown. Operative Showdown! And the Operative Showdown today, we're gonna be chatting about the Hand of the Archon. Um, the, those wicked, horrible elves that we all love so much. For the first pairing in the Operative Showdown for the Hand of the Archon, we have the Crimson Duelist versus the Flare. Yeah, both operatives that are kind of like melee focused operatives, you know, one that's trying to play a little bit more defensively because you can knock off two melee attacks and then the other one just a huge tank. Kind of wondering, you know, compare and contrast them, Kurt, because I know you have a little bit of experience with Handy the Archon. Jason does, too. So, you know, I'm sure you guys might have some interesting back and forth about your favorites and like how you use these operatives. Yeah, I do. I've been I've been playing uh, Hand of the Archon uh, as we as you said, uh, and these two are my favorites in the roster. I would say, I love I love playing melee teams. I love these guys. Um, the flare just handing out 
paint tokens. Yeah, it's great. Great. Plus the the flares damage reduction and it like is to a minimum of one is pretty ridiculous. And yeah, an it's infinite ridiculous. number of uh, las gun shots. Combining it with the feel of pain, you know, it's wow, he's a monster. Yeah. Do you do you find that players generally interact with the flare like? When you sit down and you play against a player and you and they look at the Crimson Duelist, the Flare, basically like the two melee centric models, do players play different more around one or the other? And when they do, which kind of teams like how do you guys interact with these operators? Because they're both melee ostensibly, but they have very different roles on the battlefield, I would assume, from not having played them. Uh, you can start out on this one. Yeah, I feel like um, they are both really strong. And I think most people, when they look at it, they're going to be more afraid of what the Crimson Duelist is going to do. Just because the flare doesn't really seem like that big of a deal until all of a sudden, like, he's tanking way more than he should. So it's it's kind of like the Duelist is your hammer and the flare is your dagger. Where like it's the the duelist is the big scary one that's gonna run out and fight people, and then the flare is gonna like sneak in and stab you in the kidney, which is what actually kills you. Mm. Yeah, I I uh, when I when I play them, I used um, the flare as a more offensive piece actually, just to get those extra pain tokens quickly to get the team rolling, and then I would use um, the duelist more to like support, especially if I play loot or secure to support my. Um, uh, my way of, you know, securing those victory points, uh, denying it for uh, my uh, opponents. You're using uh, the duelist because people don't want to charge into her because in melee, she's much harder to deal with, right? Because she double parries. Yeah, and to, uh, you know, the brutal display, brutal display ability. That's when she kills someone, she makes it harder for them to interact with objectives. E exactly. Yeah, exactly. So until yeah, we start at the next turning point, I think uh, the enemy the objective cannot perform mission actions and pick up actions or control objective markers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so for, for secure and loot, the, the mm -hmm. duelist can manage just horde team's ability to interact with things. And against the elite melee operatives, she can still hold her own if she starts the fight because she's got four attacks on, I think, threes. And double parry means that even against five attacks, she stands a chance of doing a reasonable amount of damage or killing an operative sometimes yeah the crimson duelist is See, it's even better twos. it's yeah. hitting on twos oh all right well and it's brutal brutal under flail it's so strong mm -hmm. and then for the flare I, it sounds like both of you are both of you using it for the pain tokens and if you are which operatives are you keeping around six inches like which which models you're trying to supercharge with the flares free pain tokens <laughs> and the duelist <laughs> yeah keep her close by um no, but there's so much. It doesn't really matter because uh, if you get this free pain token onto someone else, for the first, you're probably taking the tack up with the pain token tally. Um, so that that's a good one. And then it doesn't really matter. Uh, just this opportunity to put an extra APL in the start of an activation on a model close by or a model that had moved up on the uh, on the board to um yeah put more pressure on uh, i think it's great yeah and like supercharging a gunner if the gunner's nearby um i like to think about my gunners as like a melee piece that that can shoot so i'll just like i stack the entire team to be super loaded up with melee and then um everyone can move forward everyone can be a menace in melee and then if it just so happens that i can also pull off a shot it's a great bonus um, mm. I'm also on Team Dark Lance. Like, there was a bunch of people saying, like, I saw a bunch of discussions where people saying the Dark Lance wasn't good. Um, I completely do not agree with that. The Dark Lance hits like a truck, and then it just like get, the momentum. It just builds its own momentum because, like, if you kill an intercessor, that gets you two pain tokens, and the next time he shoots again, you can you've got a reroll and you can dash away afterwards, or you can have like three APL. Um, you could like turn that into opening doors or doing mission actions and stuff. And then also just in general, really just anyone being around the flare, even if it's just like your agent is amazing because having that third APL now, whoever is just like further up the board with your flare can do a mission action and fight someone. And just like the extra mileage you get out of that is just super duper amazing. So like, there's so many combos there. Like, I don't think there's a wrong choice 
for anyone like every single model on here you can give an extra apl to and like completely mm. swing the game with it i totally agree I think the dark lens is a really good combination with the with the flayer's extra pain token, and I I don't usually run heavy gunners, but if I do, I only use the dark lens on open board uh, to move him up like turning point one, and then might maybe get an ox- a pain token from the flayer, and I would use the splinter cannon on ITD to like move in and move into room and guard. Use the splinter cannon and guard. You're yeah. using the in that situation. You're using the extra attack of the splinter cannon to really just make sure that your guard Overwatch does something exactly. reliable. Yeah, mm. and if you get lucky, you shoot someone. You could like dash out of a room. Exactly. Oh mm-hmm. man, you could do that on an Overwatch, couldn't you? I hadn't even thought of that. I guess it's on Use a kill. Right? I think you you get to run away. <laughs> It's, it's honestly pretty hard to position because you'd basically be like at the edge of a door, which just means that to break that overwatch window would be like almost trivial, I think, for like a guard shot. Because you can just get an obscuring shot and and pop them. But if someone is not paying attention, you could definitely get away with it. So, Jason, I'm curious, you're you always playing the heavy gunner or are you taking an agent every now and then? Um. So I let's see, I feel like I always brought an agent well you have to always take one right i think you have to bring an agent no matter what i don't Um, think you're allowed to the extra the extra agent the extra agent um instead of the heavy gunner i would bring the heavy gunner if i was against any kind of elites and i brought it every time and then like even against stuff like breachers just for the damage reduction you just hit him with the dark lance anyways and then the momentum still carries and it still is like a beast but in like a lot of other stuff um i've Let's see. I feel like there was at least one game that I brought an extra agent in when I had my giant spell. But like, I feel like you could get away with always bringing the heavy gunner um, just because if you stack him up as a melee menace and then he's just running around like acting like he's the agent. But then when he shoots, it's like it's a dark lance. It's yeah, I think kind of just a fun bonus. Jason is talking. I think we've talked with uh, Kenya Roll Crit about this and how using the dark lance as a melee operative can be can lead to a more powerful like mixed operative you don't get to shoot until after you've already charged basically so it's like for the turn after but if you give them wicked blades and refined poisons now their melee attacks are a four attacks on threes three four lethal five which is respectable against basically anything at eight or eight or lower wounds because you know lethal five with rending from the strat ploy and the ability to guarantee crits means that if you're jumping someone from the shadows you are Generally deleting an eight wound model without too, too much issue. So Mm -hmm. with all of that combination, you also have the backup of like, oh, my gun is just going to delete someone. So if you're using it as just a melee piece that happens to have a really crazy gun, players can get tripped up by it. (laughs) Yeah, especially if you like use that to fork somebody where you like you you've got some very like high priority scoring threats and then you finish the turn by charging someone with a dark lance and then killing them. Then at the start of the next turn, it's like, uh oh, uh, do I go for this high priority scoring opportunity or do I kill the Dark Lance? Because if I don't, he's going to smoke somebody. Um, and that's just kind of that's a fun little trick there. And that actually ties in really well with the theme of niche tactics today, niche tactics. which is building a game plan. And what we mean by this is just this is totally like my road trip vibe, where if I'm going to be like driving to Adepticon or whatever, like me and my friends in the car are going to be building a game plan as we, as we drive. And that's just like um, so that that's actually what we did with. Um, last year driving up to Adepticon, um, I was road tripping with a friend and then we were just like going over our factions and chatting about like, what, what's the outlook? What are the goals for, for each turning point? Um, and like, where do you try to make the big push to get the lead and victory points? And like, when are you chill and just like staying in the shadows and like, mm-hmm. how do you build your combos? And then look for, looking for those like scoring fork type opportunities, like I mentioned before, um so yeah so that's kind of that's the overview of the niche tactics today so um jumping right in what like do you kind of have like a game plan or like a template for any teams um or like hand of the archon if we want to stick with that um like is a great example because of the way that for darkness from darkness death works um has that kind of like guided you to create any kind of um game plans ahead of time 
Um, yeah, I would say it's been a while since I played Hand of the Arkin, but uh, I have always tried to have have had a, a game plan for my for my tournament games. Uh, and when you're playing like Eldari teams, um, you need if you feel like I feel like I have to move up uh, turning point one just to place myself where I have multiple threats and be the one that first start you know trading, doing good trades. You know, with the the gunners or uh, the melee threats, and come in, come out on the upper hand from those trades. That's like, yeah, that's what I'm doing more or less when I'm playing in Lari. Yeah, do you feel like you have different game plans based on like the size of your opposing team? Because I know as an elf player, you're always outnumbered by the human teams, and you're never outnumbered by the elite. So you're like somewhere in the mid range, mm-hmm. and with only eight yeah. wounds, you really don't have a ton of room to just get operative sacrifice, I think is what you're talking about, making sure you make good trades. So exactly. what do you change how you approach your creating your game plan against different kinds of teams? Yeah, for sure. And it mostly has to do if you're playing an elite team or an elite team or a horde team, of course. Um, yeah. <laughs> Which operatives yeah. do you use in those situations and how do you change it up between hordes versus the leads so most recently i've been playing uh, legionary uh, so i think that's easier for me to talk about right now sure. um so when i it's just six operatives i try to just move up the board set up two or three threats for turning point two uh, and those threats have to be minimal minimal risk for me you know and how do you how do you I, approach uh, building minimal risk for a legionary team? For a legionary team, okay. Mm-hmm. So most recently, I've been playing uh, Corin and Sench. Hey. Uh, yeah, I think it's a really fun combination between marks. Um, so my gunners always have Sench, and my leader, actually, I'm, my, the couple of last games I've been running him Corin, which is not something I never thought I would do. Um, but like my gunners, keep them safe, keep them hidden, keep them obscured, uh, move up, concealed with my corn operatives. Not my leader though; he will be like in behind. Um, and I always run my um, and my um, uh, I, lost, I lost the name. Psyker? Uh, no, my uh, sorry, oh, no Shrey Talon. Shrey Talon. I don't use him as a corn operative. I use him as uh, a sense operative, so I can have this mutability of change, um, extra APL. I load him up with a um, crack grenade, so I can like either I can move dash put down the mark, or I can move dash uh, shoot and take and uh, score a mission action, or I can charge, fight, throw my crack have a mission do a mission action you know so he's uh, i'm trying to put him in a position where i can kill two models and take a point okay. for turning point two i think yeah. that's the first time i've heard someone say the the zinch shrive talon and that's like such a valid argument love that mm. yeah, i love playing him that way i'm playing them right now actually in the cpts tournament uh haven't had great success yet but i think uh, it will uh, I yeah people yeah come. the CPTS <laughs> tournament is a tough crowd I'm in there too just like getting like I'm just like coming out of my work season and getting my butt kicked playing intercession repeatedly are um, you guys at the yeah. spot yet where you're planning around letting your opponent take the objectives on turn one and then going harder turns three two through four because I've <clears throat> I, when I was playing Star Striders against one of my local players made it very clear if he went for an even split, he would lose a model because of the way Star Striders work, where you can move up 11 inches and then drop a laser beam on someone. So if you go up to the midboard objectives and you're not mm-hmm. paying attention, I will delete a, a Marine. So I was telling him, like, do not go for a 3-3 three, three split or 4-2 split because you are just way overextending on turn one. And I know against commandos, this is definitely a thing that people complain about, where commandos easily get like a 4-3 or 4-2 split on turn one. Mm-hmm. But if you can plan around, you know, losing those first two and then making sure you win turns three or two turns two through four you 
position your models on turn one differently rather than like, oh, I'm going to have to, I have to go out into the mid board objective and lose a model, which is not probably the case. Your goal as an elite player is to get to the point where both players are basically the same number of operators, right? You really want to get to turns three and four with four space marines against four humans. And that's like your, or maybe even five or six humans. And that's kind of your happy spot because you have three APL versus their two APL. And if you're on their objectives, they're not scoring your objectives because they're not generally going to come in, come into your base, right? You're leaving your objectives behind and fighting on their objectives. So I'm wondering if you guys have basically, if you're working with that, I'm just curious. I feel like I can tie this in with Hand of the Archon again. Um, and kind of one of the things that I thought about with that and like the game plan ahead of time was that I can be a little like I would love to get a 3-3 split, but if it looks like it's not going to be great, I would way rather have a single turn that hits outrageously hard, like especially like something um, against commandos. Like I haven't played against like someone that was like a super, super amazing commandos player with Hand of the Archon. But, like, to get through that just a scratch, you need to, like, kill the whole team in one turn is kind of, like, what you want to do when you're fighting against commandos. So, and that that fits really well with the whole way to play the Hand of the Archon, which is just, like, lurk unbelievably hard and don't give anyone line of sight on anything. And then once people are, like, coming out, it's like you're letting the cows come out into the grass and, and feed and get fat and happy with their little victory point lead. And then all of a sudden you come blasting out from behind every barrier and just like triple critting everything you see. Um, yeah. And just kind of like trying to, trying to set up for that, like very intentionally. Um, if it's, if it's someone that is going to be moving up or if like the board is set up in a way where there's a bunch of mid board stuff where people are going to like overextend to get there early. Um, it kind of like, sets you up for a turn two super ambush but if it's like if there's nothing on the midline and like you kind of have to creep up a little bit more it's kind of more of like a turn three ambush um and then also paired with that with that i like to do objective markers that you can completely score at the end of the game and you can just like completely not worry about it and it doesn't give put any kind of pressure on you to make any kind of a rash decision in the early game so like robin ransack is is great to pull off on turn three and four um, and then I actually have been doing assassinate target in almost every game. And I think there's only one person that's denied it for me, which has been like just kind of a crazy thing where if you play is just like a hand of the archon player, is it like an in general thing? Just like an in general thing. Um, like it, I think it was ultimately the craziest assassinate target thing. And then this was also kind of part of a, uh, building a game plan, which it's built on like a similar principle. The way that I was playing Legionary was 100% corn. Every single model is corn. And I just try to chain lightning through the enemy like, like crazy. Um, and then people are always like, against Legionary, they want to bait you out. So they'll give you like a dangling model and be like, if you come out and charge this pleb, then I can shoot you with my space laser and you die. But then the reality mm. is... If you give me that pleb, I'm going to charge past him and barely tag him at one inch. I'm going to kill him in melee, and then I'm going to move three inches and tag someone that's already activated, and you are just never going to get a chance to shoot him. And he's just going to, like, use your enemies, like, use the enemy pieces as hostages, use them as cover, and just chain lightning through things. And then it kind of becomes, like, not even terrain dependent if you can just, like, chain activate these movements right to hold people hostage. Um, and then that's like, you don't want to give yourself any reason to make a bad choice early. You want all of your scoring to be at the end of the game. And then like, if you've got a melt a gunner with a combat knife and he's just like chain lightning through people and stabbing everyone to death. And then all of a sudden he stabs someone, gets a free three inch move, takes a six inch move and then shoots a melt a gun. Like he's going to get that assassinate target. It's actually an interesting way of thinking about assassinate target. I think for specifically corn legionaries. Just because you can abuse the perpetual aggression movement on something like a melt gunner where your mm -hmm. opponent just really isn't going to expect the extra three inches of movement. Because if you're, you know, like you're saying, if you take an eight inch charge, you overcharge someone and then you take a three inch dash for free, you are now 11 inches up the board, which does mean that you now have a melt -a gun target probably, I think, on basically any team. Because yeah. there's ways to space out so that the first guy is not dangerous. But if the next thing that's, if the next dangerous play is not a melee action, but a gun action, that is definitely a big step up i think <clears throat> and also the fact that to, to keep safe against the double melee threat you literally have to have your models like six inches apart and like no one's going to realize that and even if they do like you can't it's not really practical 
So I've just like I've caught a lot of people completely off guard with just that crazy chain lightning effect, which is definitely one of my the most amusing things. And like the whole thing started off 100 percent as a joke where someone was like, I dare someone to play 100 percent corn. Like, don't even bring the psyker. And I was like, that sounds fun. I'm going to try it out. And then it just like kept on being more and more powerful. And every time I played a game, I was like, there is something here. This is <laughs> this is wild. Yeah, I love it. How, I love it. How have your experiences on corn, corn zang, uh, zinchpin, Kurt? Have you had some uh, success with Perpetual Aggression? I have most recently at the uh, team tournament. Of course, uh, I love I love the ploy Perpetual Aggression. It's such a great ploy. Uh, I love the passive when you can turn uh, a normal into crit damage, not into a crit but crit damage. Uh, combining those, combining those two. I love the butcher. Uh, I know he's been um, he's he's got a lot of shit before, but I think he's an up and comer operative. Agreed. I would say more people will uh, find him interesting. I love the bubble he has. I love the anointed. I love the shrive talon. All the melee operatives. Uh, I all, almost always run all the melee operatives. Uh, the leader with the power fist into uh, intercession or two seven wood models. Uh, the Bay of Fire, I always run him. Uh, I, I, th I think like he's the operative I have been struggling with the most. He has such great potential, but I find myself using him more or less like uh, a buffing machine and a um, mission action taker, point taker. Uh, I would say, yeah. And then I always run the plasma gunner as well. Do you do the thing with the butcher where you're giving him um, a malefic blade just so he has a more reliable melee profile instead of the yeah. four tech and fours, four, seven, you know, every once in a while you make one hit on eight dice and cry. Yeah, exactly. I always put a malefic blade on him. If he gets charged, uh, he needs a different weapon profile for sure. Yeah, yeah, I give him the malefic blade and the grizzly trophy. <laughs> I usually put the Grizzle Trophy on the, the Anointed, but it has Ooh, happened. I do like uh, that. Yeah. And For have sure, you yeah. found more success with the Butcher as an aggressive piece or kind of like a weird zony piece by him existing on a point with cover, your opponents have to play weird around him. Like he's a, he's a good mid-board objective holder with the barricade or a piece of terrain because opponents now have to like swing all the way around pieces of terrain. And is that how you're using him or are you... Missling him down the lane and just going, uh, go kill someone and uh, we'll see what you do afterwards. Well, uh, it depends on the map layout, if I bring him or not. But if you play like Octarius, the TPT uh, turning point tactics maps, uh, I usually play him around uh, a door or, um, or the oil rig where you can find good cover lines for him. Uh, and if I play ITD, if I have like small rooms up in the middle of the board, um, he's a great player to he, operative to put there to deny um, your enemy operatives to come into the room unless they charge you and then you have the malefic blade. Exactly. Yeah, I, th I think of like for the butcher in Into the Dark, I think of him as a can opener where he just like runs open to the door, he opens it and then you just like you just wait for him to kill you because you can't really do anything else. Like if you charge him, he's going to chop you in half. If you don't, he's going to charge you and he's going to chop you in half. And like you can't run up and shoot him because of his two inch denial area. So he's just like the perfect like can opener. We're just like yeah, he... that room is fish in a barrel and that dude is a shotgun. Yeah, we definitely mentioned yeah, I think in uh, weeks past that, you know, you want to make sure the doors are open by the time the butcher is next to a door. Because if the door is closed, they will come and shoot you. <laughs> but as long as it's open, him standing next to a door is just a is just a menace. It is. So when an Eldari profile or a human profile shards you as a butcher uh, and you have the perpetual aggression turned on, it you know, it can go can go wild from there. Yeah. Yeah, it can't just spiral way out of control. Yeah. Does perpetual oh, perpetual aggression works on opposing turns? Yeah, and you could do it multiple times. So like I could charge, kill someone, move three inches, kill that person with a double fight, move three inches again, and now all of a sudden they've just made fourteen inches of movement in this turn. And like oh, someone yeah, yeah. that thought I, they were I, safe, I definitely know like, that. 
it works on it works on your turn, but I, I think Kurt just mentioned, you know, on in the dark if someone charges you and uh you kill them, you do still get the charge. Or you still get the move, right? I don't think there's anything that stops yeah, it. Yeah, it does I'm... it does happen. Like, yeah, if you charge them and then they kill you, they will just pile into someone else. Yeah, so the butcher on in the dark with a blade just sitting behind an open door is just miserable. Yeah, it's like kind of game ruining. <laughs> Yeah, I think many people have been sleeping on him before, but I think, yeah, he's great. Yeah, he's Situ- a situational, situational, situationally very powerful model. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, in exactly. maps where there's not enough cover, he's just he's just a liability, right? Because if he can't get into position where his abilities are going to do anything, then he is just a, a just a melee, a melee dork with a bolt pistol, which is not not great for the team that needs all six of their operatives to do something impactful on the board. Yeah. And. All right, so going into approaching game plans, you know, setting up your melee operatives since this turned into a corn corn legionary niche tactics once again. Making sure you're yeah. safe on turn one so that on turns two and three, you perpetual aggression into your opponent's backline, leaving behind your own objectives. That seems like a good game plan to me. Honestly, if if I can't have them, no one can. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like, you know, we're we're running out of things to talk about a little bit, so... You know, were there any final things about the Swedish kill team scene that you wanted to call it? Other TOs, other events that you have coming up? Or, you know, just, yeah, tell us a little bit before we head out, Kurt. Yeah, uh, I would like to give a big shout out to all the TOs in Sweden. We have uh, Kalle up in Stockholm. He's running an event now in December, in the beginning of December. And uh, I would love to see Scandinavian people go there. I can't go myself. Um and a big shout out to the Copenhageners over there. I love to see you coming over uh, the water, take the bridge over, uh, join us at our next event in Gothenburg with Michael Teoing, champion over there. Yeah, and my local game store, Rapid Tabletop, of course. Big up yeah, to when's them. Your, uh, when's your next tournament lined up? We'll see. I have nothing in the pipe right now. Okay, okay. Jason, you've got the Renegade Wargaming tournament coming up. Are, are you still doing the Kill Team thing, or are you adjusting to push the end a little bit harder this year? Um, I'm doing both. So I am. I'm still going to be doing the the Renegade, like running that stuff, like setting up the terrain and like judging things. Um, and I might bring some speakers for the at least the Friday event, play some music. But uh, I am definitely looking at pushing the end a lot more this upcoming year. I've got some some fun goals for that. Yeah. And, you know, thanks again to a sponsor, Luster's Workshop, for their Kill Team Gauge. You know, just another Kill Team Gauge. And final shout out to our Patreon, even though we've shouted out a couple of times. But, you know, it's been growing, so it'll be nice to have more people on there to help us uh, grow the show, get new microphones, all that, all that jazz. And Jason will be putting up his special uh, indie wargaming rules. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Kurt, thanks. Thanks for uh, coming on and chatting up about uh, Sweden. Seems like we'll be uh, catching up with some of the other Swedish Kill Team scene people, and hopefully Copenhagen will have uh, swung by next time we uh, catch up with you guys. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you so much, guys. Yes, thank you. And thanks, listeners, for making to the end of the podcast.